Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here with you all to have this opportunity to, again, gather together, to assemble, to worship our great and glorious God, and to open up the other portion of his word this morning and study from that. If you will, this morning, open up to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, and we're going to primarily be looking in the book of James this morning, starting there in chapter 3, looking at what I think among a lot of Christians is a very difficult verse. And it's one, as I've gone and preached in various locations and states and talked to a number of Christians, I think it's one of the more misunderstood verses among the church. And that begins there in James chapter 3, there in verse 1. Seems we're having a problem with the songs this morning, so let me skip ahead to where I need to be. James chapter 3, there in verse 1 reads, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. A lot of times when we read that, we look at, okay, so most of us should not be teachers in God's Word, and we should not be teachers in the church, and we should not be teachers of the family, because that's what James says. There should not be many teachers in the church. And I've heard Christians say that. Now what we're going to look at this morning is this verse in context, because does it sound like God does not want His people to be teachers in His kingdom anywhere else in the Bible? Has He ever said, we have too many workers, it's too difficult of a job, so sit down and let someone else do it? Is that a message we read anywhere in the Bible? No. We're all called to be teachers but sometimes we read just this one verse and we don't keep the rest of the book of James in context. James is writing to Christians and he will talk about those who should not teach in this book, but we'll see as we go on, yes, maybe now you should not be teachers because you have problems, but here's what we need to do in order to fix this so you can be a teacher. Starting off there in 1 James, Chapter, first in James chapter 1, he talks about some of those who should not teach being those who have an incorrect view of God. If you are a Christian, but you do not love God, well, yeah, you have no business being a teacher because it's going to show in what you teach. It's going to show in your attitude, and you're missing kind of the whole point of being a Christian. You have no business being a teacher right now. James chapter 1 there in verse 12, as he's beginning writing these letters to Christians. James 1 and verse 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. If you love God, if you love Christ, that's going to come out in your teaching. You're going to be zealous for good works. You're going to want to share the good news that you have been given and you are going to be excited. Baseline, if you don't love God, you're not being a good Christian. And you definitely cannot then also be a Christian who's also teaching God's word because you don't love him. And he goes into a little bit more into detail about this. Verse 13, he continues saying, Let no one say when he is tempted, well, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. If you've got this attitude as a Christian, that when temptation comes upon you, when disease comes upon you, when trial comes upon you, why did God do this to me? Do you have any right teaching? Absolutely not, because you're missing some of these basic, fundamental principles that you should understand as a Christian. God Himself cannot be tempted, and He is not the one who tempts anyone. So you're right. If you go on and you try and start being a teacher from then on, you're going to receive a stricter judgment because you don't have your bases settled. And more than likely, you're not going to teach what God's Word says because if you don't love God and you believe that He tempts people, that's going to come out in your teaching. You're going to receive a stricter judgment and you have no business teaching it. You have things you need to work on. Last point in this section. If you are unwilling to conform to God's will, what business do we have being a teacher? <laughs> 
The whole point of being a preacher or being a teacher or being an example is you're showing people here is what God's Word says. And if you want to be saved, if you want to be righteous, if you want to be a part of His kingdom, you must conform to it. But if you're not willing to conform or I'm not willing to conform, what business do we have being a teacher? James addresses this because this was a problem in some of the Christians he was talking to. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness. Receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Some of the problems that James was writing about to some of these Christians is some of you are getting up and some of you are being teachers and some of you are being influences in your church and in your community and in your home and you have wickedness running rampant in your life. You need to work on this. Same kind of attitude Jesus preached about in his Sermon on the Mount. You first need to get the plank out of your own eye before you start dealing with the speck in your brother's eye. You've got to get yourself righteous, understanding basic biblical principles, and work on that first. Then you can start being a teacher. Then you can really start being effective for God. Because that's really the whole point that James is going to go over and over and over again throughout this book. You cannot teach while living in sin. That does not mean, and we'll talk about this in more detail in a few moments, that teachers can never sin, because if that's the attitude, none of us can be teachers again. But rather, if you are living in sin, if you are keeping hold of verse 21, that filthiness, if you are overflowing with wickedness, then you need to fix this before you can become a teacher. We'll see some of the sins that he just begins to talk about here. We're not going to go through an exhaustive list this morning. But beginning in chapter 1 and verse 19, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, but slow to speak. Slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. If you are a wrathful, if you are an angry, if you are a vengeful Christian, then you don't have any business teaching. If it gets you to the point that when you're trying to teach and you're unwilling to listen to anybody else and you have to be right and you are angry and you are wrathful and you get puffed up every time a question comes out or any time a challenge comes up about God's word, are you going to be an effective teacher? I've seen teachers like this and they don't get very far. Well, listen, can't you understand? I read it to you plain as day. Why can't you get it through your thick skull? This is what God's Word says. You don't believe me? That's not an effective teacher. That's not instructing someone. That's not helping someone. But if that's a consistent attitude that you have, James is right. You have no business being a teacher. And if you continue with that kind of attitude, guess what you're going to be judged on when you stand before God? You didn't really do any teaching. You took a pedestal and you built yourself up with pride and with anger and you really didn't help anyone except maybe to set the example of what a teacher should not do. So correct, you shouldn't teach while you're a wrathful or vengeful Christian. You should not teach if you're a partial Christian. Christian. James chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, James talks about this. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin. You are convicted by the law as transgressors. Who is the gospel for? Everyone, every single soul that has been created in the image of God, every single human being that is ever born, that's who the gospel is for. 
Jesus died for every living soul that has ever taken breath on this earth. If you then want to be a worker in His fields, if you then want to be a teacher, and you start choosing who I'm going to teach and who I'm not going to teach, and who I'm willing to talk to and who I'm not willing to talk to, and we start making judgment calls of who we think is worthy of our time and who is not worthy of our time, so I'm not even going to bother trying. Yeah, you have no business teaching. It's not, well, I'm talking with someone and they keep spitting it back in my face and they're not interested in God's Word, and so I'm going to move on. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about showing partiality. He's talking about, okay, the rich person comes into the congregation and the poor person comes in, so we all pay attention to the rich person and the poor person gets neglected. That's paying attention to who I'm going to teach based on skin color. That's paying attention to who I'm going to teach based on how much I like their personality. That's based on who I'm going to teach based on I know their family and I know this person or I know how much money they can bring into a congregation. That's based on who I'm going to teach, based on what they're doing in their lives right now. If they're really, really sinful, I'm not going to even bother teaching them. If they're a really good person, I think they'd make a great asset to the church. That's who I'll focus on. That's all partiality. And again, you've lost sight of a basic principle of God's Word. Salvation, the Gospel, what you're supposed to be teaching is for everyone. If you have a consistent problem with that, no, you should not be a teacher. Not that you can never become one, but you need to fix this before you can be a teacher. You need to address this. You need to address this attitude if you are a rebellious Christian. Back in James chapter 1, beginning there in verse 13 this time. James 1 there in verse 13, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But if each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and he is enticed, then when desire is conceived and it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. If you're the type of Christian that, well, I know what God's Word says, but why does he allow me to constantly be tempted? Or why does he tempt me? Or any time a temptation comes along, you fall for it every single time. Are you going to make a good teacher? Can you honestly get up and preach and teach or talk to your children or talk to your neighbor or talk to your friends or your coworkers about God's word? about staying in His kingdom, about remaining faithful when they can see in your own life that you constantly fall prey to sin and the very things that you preach that you should stand against. You've got some work to do if that's the case. Again, it's not that you can never sin and be a teacher. If that's the case, none of us can ever be teachers. But if you have this constant pattern of every time desire comes along, any time someone can entice you with something, any time Satan can try to tempt you, you fall for it, you need to step back and you need to fix that. You need to take the plank out of your own eye before you can really be effective. You cannot be a teacher if you are unloving. James 1 and verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Some of the principles we'd already talked about there, but one of the principles in that verse is that you need to be compassionate. You need to be loving. You need to care. You need to have sympathy for those that are in the world, for those that are hurting, for those that are dealing with sin, for those that are lost, for those that are hungry. For those that don't have it good, you should be compassionate. You should be loving. Jesus would not be our Savior if he didn't say things like, Jerusalem, how I wish I could gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under my wings. Jesus would not be our Savior if he did not weep 
looking upon the people made in His own image. Knowing what the end result of their sin is going to be unless they turn. There are some Christians, there are some preachers I know that have very little to no compassion or love at all. And it breeds worse problems. It makes them wrathful. It makes them partial. It makes them impatient. Because they don't look at someone in sin and weep and hurt. They just treat them, well, you're just not worth my time. You're less than dirt. You're not someone it's even going to bother talking to. I've told you about the man in the church I grew up with that he would consistently go around teaching people, and if they weren't converted in his five lesson series, then he would never talk to them again, and if they ever became converted down the road, well, they're not really a Christian because I tried teaching them and they didn't listen. That's someone who's unloving and unqualified to be a teacher. And if you die in that state, you better believe you're going to answer to God for that attitude. That's what James is talking about. Be cautious. Really examine yourself. If you have a problem, fix it. If you are unloving, you're missing again one of these basic principles of what it means to be a Christian, and it's going to come out in your teaching as well. If you are an envious Christian, you're going to, again, have problems. James 3 there in verse 13 beginning. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in meekness and wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but it is earthly, it is sensual, it is demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every other thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure and peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James is talking about what he talked about there in verse 1. Listen, if you are an envious and you are a bitter person, do not lie to the truth. You cannot lie to God and say, well, yes, I'm going to teach the truth and I'm going to be an effective teacher and I'm going to be an effective preacher and I'm going to be an effective example. It's going to come out earthly, sensual, and demonic wisdom from your mouth. That bitterness, that envy is going to show itself. You're going to teach what you know and what you practice. If you have a problem with this kind of envy, this kind of bitterness, you have no business teaching until that is fixed. If you have a problem with what James 5 calls being restless, then you need to deal with this. James 5, beginning in verse 7, begins, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door, and my brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and of patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen to the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and very merciful. This is a big one for all of us. I think we all can agree we struggle with this at some point. But if you are consistently going to be a restless person, if you are impatient, you're not going to be an effective Christian and you're not going to be an effective preacher, an effective teacher, an effective parent, an effective friend or a coworker that's trying to show someone else the gospel. Because you're going to see things you don't like, you're going to hear things you don't like, and you're going to go restless, and you're going to lash out at others, you're going to grumble, you're going to gossip, you're going to have all these problems, 
It's going to come out in your teaching. It's going to come out in your life. And it's going to affect the church in Christ's name. We need to have the patience of Job. We need to have the patience of a farmer waiting for his crop, knowing that what God's word has promised is true and it will be fulfilled. Knowing that no matter how bad the world gets, or our country gets, or the government gets, or anything around us gets, God's word will stand true and it will far outlast every single problem that Satan can throw at us this world, and our loved ones. A lot of restless Christians are not satisfied with God's answer and leave the faith. Restless teachers who are not satisfied with God's word often also take their family with them. Can often take a majority or all of a church with them. Can lead friends and family members and congregations astray. Because we're no longer satisfied with what God says, we're going to do what we want to instead. James says, have the patience of Job. Have the patience of these prophets like Isaiah who weeped openly at the sin in their country, in their government, at their own afflictions, but remained faithful. And God gave them the end that He intended. He blessed them abundantly. He remembered their name in the book of life. That's what we need to be as Christians, and if we hope to be teachers, that's the attitude that we need to have. We need to get rid of this attitude of pride. James 4 and verse 6 hits on this again. James 4 and verse 6, he gives, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he said, God resists the proud, but he will give grace to the humble. If you're a prideful person like we have talked about, God is not going to be with you in your teaching. If you have a problem with gossiping, you're not going to be a good teacher. James 3 and verse 3 talks about this. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, that we may turn their whole body. If you're going to teach, especially if you're going to use your tongue to teach, you've got to bring your body and your tongue under subjection. You've got to have an attitude of self-control. If you do not, down in verse 10, he continues on, here's what happens. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth both fresh and bitter water from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt and fresh. The fact of the matter is, if you get up and teach your family, if you get up and teach in the church, if you get up and preach, if you teach your coworkers or your friends or your family members God's word, and then turn around and use that same tongue for evil, brethren, you may have just ruined or made it much harder for another godly teacher to come along behind and try and teach them the truth. Because you were unwilling to bridle your tongue. You were unwilling to bring it under subjection. That's what he means when he says, you'll receive a stricter judgment. Because you tried to tell people that they're supposed to bridle themselves, they're supposed to humble themselves to God's word, and you're unwilling to do so yourself. Not that you dropped a hammer on your foot the other day like a buddy of mine did, and yelled out a curse word at work and immediately apologized. Accidents can happen. A slip of the tongue can happen. And he apologized and told his co-workers, I've sinned, I apologize, you know me, I would never normally say something like that. It's not those kind of people God's telling not to be teachers. It's the kind of people who say one thing one minute and turn around consistently and say something contradictory. Those people 
if they are us, are going to have to answer to God. If you are an adulterous Christian, same kind of attitude, just a different wording here. Obviously, if you are adulterous in your marriage, you're not going to be effective as a teacher because kind of like we've been talking about this entire sermon, you're living one way and teaching something else. But in James 4 and verse 4, he talks about this kind of attitude again. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James is talking to Christians here who at this point should be teachers. Some of them are teachers who are examples, who are Christians, and you're trying to tie yourself to God's kingdom at the same time remaining a friend to the world, to the sin, to the corruption, and everything else in it. You cannot set your goal on earthly things and spiritual things at the same time. It's not that teachers cannot save money. It's not that they cannot make a living. It's not that they cannot take care of themselves and family. But if one thing has to take priority, you've got to choose. You can't have a split allegiance here. If you're trying to be a part of God's kingdom, but oh, I've got a split allegiance because, well, if something else comes up that supersedes what going to church, that's more important than I'm going to go do that instead. If there's activities I want to do, if there's extra work and overtime I want to take, if there's friends I want to see, if there's vacations I want to take, and, well, i got to miss a couple church services, then so what? You're, you're not fit to be a teacher. You're not a faithful Christian. Second Peter, I like the way it puts it over in 2 and verse 14. Same attitude again, Second Peter 2 and verse 14 reads this way. I'm sorry, I'm in 1 Peter. 2 Peter 2 and verse 14. 2 Peter 2 and verse 14 reads, <clears throat> Having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, and so enticing unstable souls, they have their heart trained in covetous practice, and they are accursed children. That's what it means by being an adulterous Christian. You've gotten a taste for one or more sins, whatever you want to call it, and you cannot let it go. You constantly think about it, and you desire it, and so you keep chasing after it. You're not a faithful Christian and you're not going to be an effective teacher if that's a problem that you have and you're unwilling to bridle yourself. If you are greedy, same kind of attitude again, this time a little more specific in James 5 beginning in verse 1. Come now, James writes to those Christian brethren, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver are corroded. And their corrosion will be a witness against you and, that you. and you will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of your laborers who mowed your field, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers which have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and in luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day for slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the just, and he does not resist you. There are some Christians that I've met that have made really poor bosses. And they will get up and teach about worldliness and about greed, and they will preach and they will teach in the church, and then I've gone and seen them in their workplace, or I've gone and worked for some of them. And you see how they treat their workers. They're trying to cheat them in every way possible. They're trying to treat them like dogs. They don't care if one person comes in and one person comes out as long as they're making the most money and they can just use somebody else. 
I've had the unfortunate pleasure of having to confront some Christians like that. And there have been some churches that lost some very big contributors to a number that sits up there on the board every Sunday. Because they were the wealthy individuals in the congregation, but they were living in sin and they were unwilling to change. It's not pleasant. But they have no right being teachers because just like everything else we've talked about, they're living in sin and they're unwilling to change. And you better believe the community knows that about your church. I've gone and worked for brother or sister so-and-so and I see how they treat people and I see that greed fuels everything about them. And you're telling me they teach and preach in your congregation? I'm not going there. People see that. And the name of Christ gets destroyed in an area because of it. So no, if you have that problem, if you have that sin in your life, you have no business being a, creature, being a teacher. Ultimately, it kind of boils down to this. James 1 and verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious, but does not bridle his tongue and deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. It can all be boiled down to that one verse. Just because you walk in a building doesn't mean you're fit to be a teacher. Just because you've been a Christian for decades does not mean you're fit to be a teacher. You have to look in the mirror. I have to look in the mirror and we each have to examine each and every one of ourselves and make sure we are bringing ourselves under subjection to what God is saying. We take care of that first and then we have to practice what we preach. James 2 is one that gets quoted a lot by Christians. And if you take James 2 in context with James 3 and verse 1, things start to make a little bit more sense, I think. James 2, beginning in verse 12, So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. For what profit does it bring, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed, and be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. We've quoted that passage over and over and over again, if you've been in the church very long. Again, it kind of sums up everything we've been talking about this morning. I've heard Christians say, well, I can be a teacher and I can be a great teacher and maybe I preached a lesson or maybe I taught a class or got up and gave an invitation 20 years ago so I can still do it. But I'm not actually willing to step up and improve and work on anything. You've got to put your money where your mouth is if you're going to be a part of God's kingdom. You've got to be growing and you've got to be putting those talents to use. You can't just say, well, I can be a teacher. I can be a song leader. I can lead a prayer. I can be religious. I can have a personal Bible study and then never actually put it into use. Just the same as you cannot get up and be a teacher, be a song leader, lead the Lord's Supper, lead a prayer, and consistently live your life in sin. Faith without works is dead. But you cannot also be a faithful Christian and sit there, not have any of the problems we talked about this morning. I don't have any problem with pride. I don't have any problem with anger. I don't have any problem with gossiping. I don't have any problem with adultery. I don't have any problems with greed. But I'm not going to get up and teach because James 3 and verse 1 says, not many of you become teachers. Teachers. 
Well, if you have faith, you need to have works too. That means you need to get up and you need to be active. You need to be doing the things God's Word commands. Because the reality is God commands us to be teachers. James 4 and verse 17, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. If you are practicing what God's Word teaches, if you are avoiding being wrathful or partial or rebellious, if you are loving if you are compassionate, if you are caring, if you are striving to be a good Christian, but you're unwilling to teach, you are unwilling to grow, you are unwilling to share the good news that you have been given, you've got the same problem as one who's living in sin and, not, and, and still teaching. You know what is good. You have the good message but you are unwilling to move. To him also, it is a sin. If complacency is the attitude you are struggling with, if laziness is an attitude that you are struggling with, when you look in the mirror and you see that, you have got to address it, and then you've got to move forward. What James is really teaching here in 3 and verse 1 is kind of the center of this entire book. Yes, teachers have to be careful. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Recognize that God wants workers in His field, but don't immediately jump to it before you're ready. Don't stay being a teacher or a preacher without examining yourself. It comes at a cost, and that means I have the best news the world has ever given, it is ever received, and I've got to put it to use. But I've also got to keep watch on myself. Teachers have to learn to be content. James 4, beginning in verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go, and we will go to such and such a city, that we will spend a year there, that we will buy and sell and we will make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live to do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Teachers, Christians have to learn to be content. This is not just a verse for preachers that preachers need to live in poverty and they just need to learn to be content. Christians have to set their sights on the ultimate goal that is heaven. And all of us, if we're stuck in the mindset, well, I'm going to be the best I can be on this earth right now and live my life while I'm young and while I still have time, and later I will focus my effort on God's Word in His church, in His service. We've got a problem and we've got to address that. You want to know what happens in the church when... Young people, and I'm saying from teenagers up to 60s and 70s young people. You know what they say when I'm, well, I'm not ready to teach and I'm not ready to lead singing and I'm not ready to work, I'm too busy right now? If they live long enough and retire, well, now I'm old, let somebody else do it. I've seen it enough in my 27 years on this earth. I'll do it later, I'll step up later, and then later comes, and well, let somebody else take care of it now. Today, each of us have to learn. What God gives us is more than plenty, but the most important thing I should be spending my time on is what His Word says. Yes, there is going to be suffering when you choose to be a teacher. James 1, verse 2 and through 6. James pretty much starts the letter out with this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. 
But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. Let him ask in faith and with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. When it comes to being a good parent, as God's word teaches, if you're going to raise your children in the Lord, you are going to have suffering. The world is not going to like you. Because you're doing what God's word says and not what everyone in the world tells you to do. If you are going to be a friend or a coworker or a family member that stands for God's word and strives to teach and strives to be an example and stand up for what God's word says, you will face suffering. Because there will be friends that you will lose. There will be family members that don't want to see you on the holidays. There will be loved ones that despise you maybe for a short time, maybe for a long time. If you're going to be a teacher in the church, you're going to be asked questions and you're going to make people angry in Bible classes and in sermons. Just the same as in your family, just the same as in work, just the same as among your friends and your loved ones. Because for whatever reason, you'll hit upon something and someone's going to get angry, someone's going to get upset, someone's going to face their own sin and they're going to lash out. I've had people storm out of sermons and out of Bible classes. I've had people get up in my face and yell at me. I've had people, because I taught the truth, try and go around and sully my name for being a false preacher. And as bad as it seemed in the moment... It's past, and I can guarantee more will come. But if you let yourself, because of doubt, because someone might get angry, someone might get upset, someone might not want me back at the Thanksgiving table, I might get asked a question I don't know the answer to, or someone might get angry at me in the church, I might lose a friend, and you don't move, well, you've lost sight of God's word. You're going to have to realize, listen, God calls all of us to be teachers, and that means there's going to be suffering that we're going to endure. You're going to endure suffering for just being a Christian and not doing anything. The more active you get and the more you grow, and I pray that's your goal, the more you're going to face. But conversely, the more you're going to put your trust in God, the more you're going to see, hey, those things that I was dreading, were not as bad as I thought they would be, and God got me through every bit of it. If you're going to be a teacher, you've got to bring yourself under subjection. We talk about this when it comes to elders. We talk about this when it comes to deacons. We talk about this when it comes to preachers. The reality is it applies to everyone. Verse 2 of James chapter 3, continuing that thought, will not many become teachers, knowing that we'll receive a stricter judgment. The reality is we all stumble in many things. And if anyone says they do not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. He is able to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits into horses' mouths that they may, horses mouths that they may obey us, that we may turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are large and are driven about by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. The reality is, James says, as hard as it may seem at first, as unfathomable as it may be that this gigantic ship, that there's no way I can possibly control this, that there's this horse that is pure muscle power and could buck me off and could go crazy and could beat me to death, if I can bring that under subjection, I can bring myself under subjection. I can teach myself. I can, with God's help, bridle my own tongue, bridle my activities so that I can teach His Word as He commands. When we bridle ourselves, then you're a person fit to teach. 
And that's something that you have to constantly work at. James ends the letter in James 5 and 19. Brethren, brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That's ultimately what God wants. That's what James is really talking about. Brethren, some of you are not bridling yourself. Some of you are not avoiding temptation. You are not dealing with the temptations that you are consistently falling into. Fix that. Turn to God. Ask for, ask for help. Humble yourselves. And then you can start saving people from eternal death. It is the greatest job. It is the greatest blessing you will ever get. My wife recently asked me, well, what would you do if you got fired from a congregation or you were unable to preach? Or what if I asked you to not preach? I said, if it's for the good of our family and it has to be done, I will stop preaching full time and get a secular job. I said, but I would not be happy and I would not trade it for anything else. I have the blessing and the opportunity of God's inspired word at my fingertips. I can help people far better with sharing this news than doing anything else. Even with all the heartaches and the problems that come with being a full-time preacher. Even though it's not going to be the typical nine to five and settling down is a little bit more wary no matter where you preach and you don't know how long you're going to stay in an area. And there are tr problems that come about with that even still. Teaching is the best thing you and I can do as a Christian. We are all called to teach. James 3 and verse 1 is not telling people God has too many workers, so don't step up. God is not telling people don't desire to teach. That's not what the book of James is saying. James 1 beginning in verse 22. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Maybe another lesson I'll preach sometime. We're not here as audience members in the congregation like we would be at a concert or a movie. We're all supposed to be here as participants. And we're all supposed to strive towards that. Be Verse 22, doers of the word and not hearers only. Verse 23, for if anyone is hearer of the word, but he is not a doer. He is like a man observing his face, his natural face, pardon me, in a mirror. For he observes himself, he goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but rather a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. There are Christians, I am sad to say, that are satisfied with being hearers only. That coming to church every Sunday and every Wednesday, maybe even every time the door is open, they are satisfied with just coming and being an audience member, watching the preachers and the teachers and the song leaders and those that get up and work, and that's enough for them. God said, you've looked into the perfect law of liberty. You've looked at your natural face in a mirror and you've walked away and said, nope, what I'm doing is good enough. Showing up is good enough. If that's the case, you've missed the entire point. Paul talked about some, or sorry, not Paul, the Hebrew writer, probably Paul, talked about some similar ideas over in Hebrews chapter 5. 
Hebrews chapter 5, a very similar situation happened. Hebrews 5, beginning in verse 12. The Hebrew writer writing to those brethren, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you ought to by this time have looked into the perfect law of liberty. You ought to have understood what God's Word teaches. You should have understood by now the urgency of the Scriptures, that people are dying around you and they are lost for all of eternity. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. We need to keep looking at ourselves, and maybe you need to look at yourself this morning, just like I have to keep looking at myself, recognizing that God's Word calls all of us to be active in His kingdom. There is no place for staying in sin. There is no place for complacency if you're going to be a part of His kingdom. The harvest is ready. Are you ready to go forth and work? If this morning you are not a Christian and you recognize some of the sinful things we've talked about this morning are in your life and you don't want to face death any longer, you have the opportunity to make that right by coming forward and confessing Jesus Christ as the Son of God by repenting of the sins, by turning your back on those things. You've looked at yourself in the mirror and you found yourself lacking and you want to be a part of his kingdom, then take the opportunity this morning and be baptized. If this morning you are a Christian and you have looked in the mirror and found yourself lacking, you've got a plank in your eye, you've got sin that you need to take care of, then do so this morning either by privately praying to God or if it's brought shame upon the church, just as he is commanded by coming forward and confessing those things. If that's the case, we will pray with you and we will pray for you and we will rejoice either way that a soul has been restored to God's kingdom. And then we will help you just as you help and encourage us to remain faithful, to be active, to be teachers in his kingdom as long as we still have on this earth. Whatever the case may be this morning, if the need calls for it, please come forward now as together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.